So I don't know if any of you were here last time or have heard me in the past. Um, I do this similar talk uh, to other groups as well, but um, I, I work with probably 75% of my clients are real estate related one way or the other. Um, so a, a lot of investors, a lot of agents, uh, I work with a lot of the Keller William Market Centers. So I've done this talk at other Keller Williams also. Um, and so, I mean, like I told most, I could talk about this all day. She, she gave me about an hour or so. But, you know, the, the, we're not glued to this outline. It's just the topics, um, if you will, to cover. But uh, I may jump around if you have questions. Happy to talk about other things or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, again, I don't always know, you know, if I'm talking to you guys, if, if you're brand new, if you're, you've been doing this for a while, if you yourself have investment properties and you're curious about how that plays in with all of this, or if perhaps your clients are investors, uh, in which case, a lot of times I get questions from an agent regarding that, you know, I have a, I have a, you know, cuff a client that I'm working with, looking for, you know, investment properties, and then they ask me questions about that too. So um, I tweak this, you know, more for the agents and self-employed individuals, assuming, you know, that you're you're mostly getting 1099 uh, income and not W two. Um, but with that said. Um, you know, like I, you know, we can talk about the investment side of it uh, when it comes to real estate, also. Okay, so that's just a quick little uh, introduction there. Um, before I guess before I really even you know get into that, anybody want to comment on anything that they do want us to talk about in particular? Just not have an idea of where which way you want to go. Thank you. Well. I joined a new team. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing the wholesale for investors. Primarily, what my focus is with the team. Um, and we just had a couple of questions today, which is strange that you're here and I even possibly answer them. Um, if you have someone that uh, owns a home, uh, how can they and they want to buy additional homes for rental? Mm -hmm. How how does the uh, depreciation work for them? Um, how does it? Uh, you know, how can they leverage? Uh, so there's depreciation and one other thing, um, capital gains. Mm -hmm. How do they address those? Mm -hmm. And does it work, you know, 29 years, whatever, for sure. commercial, but okay. for, for, you know, how does that, okay. how does that pan out? What's a good talk point to speak to a client about? Say, hey, I'm giving them savvy money. Let's figure out a better way of investing in the person. Okay. okay, that's a good question. So that's more on, on the investor side. Yes, sir. Okay, and depreciation, and we'll talk about some of that. Thank you. Anyone else? No one else. Okay, so let's just start with the basics. Um, assuming again, everybody is a 1099 uh, worker, and so now that means you're self employed. Well, for those that really don't even know yet what that means, um, you know, I always like to start out with a, just a basic discussion of. What that means, how that works, uh, that you that you're a self-employed individual, and then really everything else kind of fits into that. So once you understand, okay, this is how I'm getting paid, and this is why it's costing me more money in taxes. Now some of the rest of it and some of the planning kind of makes sense. So, so uh, a person who is employed by a company and is is an, called an employee and gets a W two. Um, they they share the social security piece with the employer. So the total FICA on Medicare is 15.3%. Typically, if I work for a company, they pay half of that, 7.65%, and I pay half of that, 7.65%. That automatically comes out of my paycheck. So I might be making $100,000 a year on a W-2, 7.65% of that comes off automatically. I never see that. That goes to the government for Social Security. Uh, and interestingly, I, I get asked this question. It might be the number one question I get asked by people who are employees. I'm paying way too much in taxes. It doesn't make any sense. How is it possible that my gross check is this, but my net check is only this? 
And then after all that, you tell me I owe money. It doesn't make any sense, right? So what you have to understand is that this 7.65 comes off the top and then they take off your federal and your state taxes on top of that. And so depending on your bracket, if you're paying even 20% in federal tax, 8% in Maryland, that's 28 plus another seven in social security, that's more than one third of the check going to taxes, okay? Now, if you're self-employed, there's no employer covering that 7.65%. So you as the self-employed person are paying both sides of it. You are now the employee and the employer. And so that 35% now just became almost 43% because there's an extra 7.65 that you have to cover because you're the employee and the employer, okay? Um, I apologize if I'm saying anything, you know, super simple, but this is really the base to start talking about everything else. So, so when you're a 1099 person, that same $100,000 of salary as an employee is now subject you're the employee and the employer, you're now paying the full tax on everything. Okay, so like I said, the full 15.3%, you're paying the federal tax plus the state tax. A lot of people confuse that. They're like, well, I'm paying the federal tax already. That's the social security piece. That's not income tax. So there are two different things. There's social security tax and there's also income tax. Okay, a lot of people don't understand that. So that that's right off the bat to understand what we're talking about and and and, and the percentages and how much tax you really could be looking at. Um, when it comes to um, when it comes to the FICA, there's like I said, two pieces. There's FICA and there's Medicare. And they're, they're both referred to as payroll taxes, social security taxes, but they're broken out into two components, FICA and Medicare, okay? The FICA is 12.4, the Medicare is 2.9. And again, if you're an employee, you share that 12.4, 6.2 each. And if you're an employee, if you are, um, if, and on the Medicare side, 2.9 or 1.45 each. When you're self-employed, you're paying both. The FICA piece is capped. There's a cap, which means up to a certain amount of income every year, that every person in the country makes, if you're working as an employee or 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 for yourself, that FICA piece gets capped, uh, whereas the Medicare goes on forever. So you can make a million dollars on a W-2 and you're always gonna pay that Medicare, that 1.45 as the employee, or if you're self-employed, uh, it's 2.9. And actually it's even higher than that, but we're not gonna go there now if you're, if you're in very high tax brackets. Uh, but as far as the FICA cap, <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, say to me, well, Social Security, you know, that's not, when I retire in 30, 40 years, that's not going to be there. And the reality is that they keep raising the cap on the FICA. So all the people that are paying into the system, being below the retirement age, they keep paying, we keep paying more and more and more and more. As an example, I don't have the exact numbers on me, but last year, um, I believe the cap was in the $148,000 range and they raised it to about 160. Okay, so basically 15% on an extra $12,000 roughly. Okay, so you know about 1,800, whatever the number is per person in the whole country is whoever makes more, more than that amount of money is now paying in the employee and the employer. And in self-employed case, you're, you're both, uh, is paying that amount extra into the social security system, which is their way of making sure that it doesn't run out of money. Okay, so it's not gonna run out of money. Uh, trust me on that one. Um, okay, so those are the basics. So my, my outline starts off with, you know, what entity should you use for tax purposes? Now, when I talk to investors, I'm referring to what entity should you use when you buy a property? When you buy a property as a rental, should that be owned by you personally? Should that be in an LLC? Should it be in a corporation? When I'm talking to self-employed people, 
uh, who are 1099 workers, it's the same, it's the same question, just worded a little differently, right? What entity should be used, if any, for tax purposes? So I'm self-employed. I receive a 1099 from my employer, or in this case, let's just say Keller Williams gives me a 1099 for, for my commission. And my commission is 50,000, 100,000, whatever the number is. Who should that 1099 be made out to? Should I be taking that personally in my own social security number? In which case that's going to end up on my personal tax return, or should I create some kind of entity and have them pay it to this company, whether that be an LLC or some kind of corporation, et cetera. So that's the question and that's what we're dealing with here. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. I have a question. So if you don't, if you do have an investment property that's not an LLC, can you also just get the umbrella extra security, you know, insurance that they have? Mm. That's whatever hundred thousand dollars or that yeah. is that kind of you can. equivalent as I'm good? not I'm not an attorney and I'm not gonna give okay. legal advice, yeah. but but you could, and some people do okay. rely on that. You, you don't have that many. I'm, I'm gonna talk about the different okay. entities. And the pros and cons of each, okay. and I'll, I'll try to Thank address you. that. But you definitely can do that. Yeah. Okay. So, so the question is, what is the difference if I report this income personally or if I run it through a company? What is there a savings to me tax wise? What's the point? Okay. So the first thing to know about you know getting the money personally, which is what most people do, especially in the beginning, because they don't even realize that they there's other options okay is if i get a 1099 for a hundred thousand dollars that's in my own social security number where does that where does that get reported for tax purposes okay so the answer to that is that on your 1040 when you do your tax return there's a schedule c okay schedule c is a, a form that you fill out that you put your income on you put your expenses on and it comes down to your net number and you pay tax on that net number Okay, so your gross commission is 100,000. You can write your expenses off. We'll talk later about expenses, but let's just say you drum up $40,000 worth of expenses between your car and your cell phone and whatever. Um, and, and you say, okay, my net income is $60,000. That all shows up on this Schedule C, okay? And <clears throat> the Schedule C says the net income is 60,000. It sends that over to the page one of your, of your personal tax return eventually and calculates tax on that money, okay? So depending on all of your other income, you're gonna pay federal income tax on that and you're gonna pay state income tax on that. What you're also gonna pay is the social security that I mentioned, okay? So roughly at this 15.3%, you're gonna pay an extra $9,000 just in social security tax. If you were an employee getting a W-2, that would have been shared you would pay half of that on your W through your W-2. The employer would have paid the other half of that. In this case, on your Schedule C, you're paying the whole thing, okay? So all of a sudden, you're hit with a $9,000 Social Security tax plus federal and state tax. So as a self-employed person, there's no taxes being withheld on your behalf, being remitted to the government. So the government expects you on a quarterly basis every three months to send them a check to pay for one quarter of your of your total expected tax. Okay. What? Can we get you a microphone? I think it'll be a little easier to hear back here. No problem. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just take a quick. So that's the same direction. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is actually very easy hour now. <laughs> it's not part of our deal. <laughs> Yeah, you make taxes so much fun, you just want to think about it. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Yeah. 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 Translate <laughs> Actually, can you hear me better now? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I actually had a I, I had a call earlier this morning with a, a prospective client who called me about doing his taxes. He has three rentals in two states, 
three W-2s in three different states, the complicated tax return. And he's he's um he's deaf. So so he called me with an interpreter. So I was talking to her, she was signing it to him, and then he was answering her, and then she was responding to me. It was, it was interesting. Um okay, so yeah. Where were we? We were talking about um, Schedule C and the amount of tax you're going to pay on this hundred thousand gross, sixty thousand net, right? So the nine thousand in Social Security tax, and then you're dealing with the federal and the state tax as well. That's one problem with being self-employed and paying a lot of tax. The other issue is that Schedule C is the highest audited form by the IRS, and the reason is because they can get an extra 15% out of you if they find any issues, right? So the higher the numbers that you have on that form, the higher the chances that the IRS might come knocking on your door and say, prove to us that you have these expenses. Otherwise, we're going to hit you for tax interest and penalty on, you know, dollar for dollar. And it's not just the tax rate that you're paying it's this extra 15 percent on top of it so why wouldn't they go after a self-employed person and say show us your receipts <laughs> right where even if you're in a 15 percent bracket you're really paying them 30 percent of this money two, two questions on the proof of that um if uh, i don't have receipts for it does my does my credit card statement vouch for that good question so he, he wants to know if credit card statement vouches for it um i'll tell you like this thank god i've not had to deal too many times with audits which i'm happy and proud of um the ones that i've been involved with over the years and there have been several um, i've been doing this a long time um it depends it really depends they could say to you no you can't give you can't just give me a credit card you know, statement that doesn't prove anything okay um and i've seen them do that uh, it also depends who the auditor is um if you get a nice reasonable person auditing uh and the expenses make sense and 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 in your ordinary course of business that is something that you would spend money on and you're showing them that you did usually they'll they'll be okay with that it depends what it is though okay uh, and, and you know just to give you an example you know you bought a 500 hundred dollar laptop you're showing them the laptop you, you know you have the credit card bill to show that you bought it you know this year they'll they'll you know they'll probably should be okay with that it's a reasonable expense you can show them that you really purchased it right um you went on a you went on a trip you went on a business trip and you had all kinds of expenses you know they'll they'll tell you well how, how do i know that's a business trip it's not personal you know what i mean so just showing up a credit card expense isn't going to help if you have receipts and it's a reasonable trip then they have to give that to you what if you have to buy things online for your business and the only thing you have to show is your credit card statement? i would not well again you should have some kind of receipt um even if you're buying it online there's still should be, you know, usually you're going to get a receipt of some sort. So, you know, most people don't save their receipts. So, you know, honestly, most people don't, you know, I have a few people who they get these fancy apps and they try to, you know, put everything and save it that way. Um, most, most people don't, uh, but you are supposed to, and you should. Um, so, for instance, what if you have detailed bonds? So for instance, we have a business expense, we take some of the client out, uh, we're talking real estate, uh, we put down the, the compensation that was had, who was defending, the cost of what it was. Sure. Yeah, I mean, logs are great, and the more you can show as proof, the better. Um, you know, when you when you when you drive, you're supposed to keep an auto log, right? And they say, well, don't, you know, don't don't make the log after the fact when you get audited. Well, you know. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that people don't do that, right? And if it is put together properly and it makes sense, and you can prove it and show, you know, we, you know, um, I was dealing with a contractor, and he and he had to show them that these were the jobs I was working on. So I was out working, you know, in the field from from this time to this time, and for those two months, 
here's the mileage and that and that works okay so that's the issue with with the schedule c so you have the audit risk and you also have taxes okay so so what 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 I find many times is that people come to me and I ask them you know what what they have going on and then they tell me that they set up an LLC and I usually say to them well why'd you set up an LLC and the answer I usually receive back is I don't know that's what I was told to do or my friend did it or you know that's what I heard is a good thing you know no nobody really knows why they didn't even set up the LLC the the L, an LLC stands for limited liability company an LLC is really a legal entity that's there to protect you if someone files a lawsuit. Okay, so we were talking before about purchasing a rental property and putting it into an LLC. The main reason why you do that is to protect yourself if somebody trips and falls and then sues you. Okay, the idea of the LLC is that they shouldn't be able to go after you personally, they can only collect from your company. Okay, now. Is that foolproof? I'm not a lawyer. If you ask five people, you'll get five different answers. Um, but my answer is always, that's what it's there for. The idea of an LLC is to protect you. So it should it should do just that. Now, does that matter, matter if it's a single member LLC where it's just you versus it's a dual member LLC where there are partners? Again, if you ask different people, you'll generally get different answers. Uh, but again, my answer is <laughs> that's what it's there for. You have to show that it's a real business and that you're doing things correctly. When it's just you, people have the habit of they, they start an LLC, they get a bank account, and then from there, they treat it like it's just themselves. And if that happens and someone sues you, their attorney is going to try to prove that and say, yeah, let's, let's ignore this company because it's really just them. Okay, but if you keep the logs, if you have, you know, really, you know, other insurance, if you have everything, you know, done correctly, then, you know, depending which, which court you're in and who the judge is, but they should, you know, respect the LLC. Uh, but again, you'll get different answers. Now, some people will say, I'll just, you know, pay for insurance and not bother with the LLC. And again, you know, it depends. If you have a umbrella policy for a million dollars on a $50,000 property, which I don't know why you would, but let's see if people, people do things like this. And then the attorney somehow find, gets wind of how much insurance you have, guess how much they're going to sue you for, as much as they can get out of the insurance, right? So you have to weigh exactly the situation, but that's, you know, that's how that pretty much goes. So let's talk for a minute about LLCs. So let's say you start an LLC and it's just you. So you protected yourself legally, but what did you do for taxes? And the answer is nothing. Because if you're a single member LLC and it's just you, even though you set up the LLC, the IRS looks at that LLC as what's called a disregarded entity. Okay, so in a disregarded entity, in a disregarded entity, basically the IRS for tax and says the entity doesn't exist. We're going to tax you the same individually as we were going to before. Okay, so. Where does that land then on your taxes? Back on Schedule C. So simply setting up an LLC if it's just you really doesn't do anything for you for taxes. Not only that, obviously if it's on Schedule C, you're still paying that self-employment tax. So you didn't do any, you didn't do yourself any favors there either. Okay. So so what does the LLC help? Well, let's say let's say this LLC is not single member. Let's say you have a partner. Okay, and sometimes it doesn't mean you have a real partner. I'll just say, add your spouse, add your friend, add your sibling, add somebody, your parent, as a capital owner, owner have some capital ownership, but not for profit and loss purposes. So in an LLC, they're very flexible. And what that means is you can draw up an agreement that says, you and I own an LLC together. I get zero of the profit and loss. You get 100% of the profit and loss. Um, until we we sell the company. When we sell the company, I own 1%, you own 99%. And that's just an example. You can draw that up any way you want. Okay. I can be partner, we can be partners, and we can say you get the first X amount of money after we hit certain profit levels, then we share it. You can do it, you can do it however you like. Right. So that's that's the advantage then of setting up a, a, a dual number LLC. What that does for taxes 
is it takes it off of your personal tax return. It's no longer considered a disregarded entity by the IRS. So where does that get reported now? It goes on a business tax return, which is a partnership return, it's 1065. So now you have to file a separate business entity tax return. You're not filing this anymore personally. What does that help? Well, let's say you're a real estate agent, you're self-employed, you're getting a 1099, and now you tell them, you know, I don't want that 1099 coming to me and my social anymore. I set up this LLC. I have an employer ID number, EIN. I want you to write the check to my LLC. And I set up a separate bank account. The money goes in there. And then from there, it's your money. You can take it, right? We'll talk a little bit later about how you pay yourself uh, when you have a company set up. But if it's a dual member LLC, that's going to get reported on a separate tax return for business purposes. Okay, it's similar to a Schedule C where, where your gross goes in and you lift all your expenses. There are other uh, forms related to, to the business side of things. So technically you're supposed to have a balance sheet, which is assets and liabilities, et cetera. So the record keeping does become more important when you set up a company um, <clears throat> as opposed to when you're doing things yourself, but that's for filing purposes, okay? If you grossed 100 and you have 40,000 no expenses, it's the same net 60. You're always gonna pay income tax on that $60,000. You're not saving federal or state taxes on that $60,000. If that's your net income, that's what you're going to pay income tax on. No different than if your W-2 was $60,000. You're gonna pay income tax on that. The question is the social security piece. On Schedule C, you're going to pay that extra 50% in social security taxes. On a, on a business return, on an LLC return, if you're self-employed, you are supposed to also pay the self-employment tax on that money. However, we're not gonna get too technical right now. There are ways through that vehicle to save on that self-employment tax, okay? And I'll explain it better when I get to the next type of company, the S corporation, but just keep in mind that there are ways to do similar things between the LLC as a partnership, adding a partner and making a 1065, as well as the S corporation. So let's talk about the S corporation so I can explain what I mean. The main difference between an S corporation and an LLC, they're the same for legal purposes. They, they are there to protect you from a lawsuit, okay? But the main thing for tax purposes is if you set up an S corp, it could be just you. You don't need, you don't need a partner anymore. So if you set up an S corporation and now you can, you can take an, L, an LLC and elect to have it treated as an S corporation. So if someone out there has an LLC existing, you can fill out a form with the IRS and it's an election to have it taxed as an S corporation. So if you do that, <clears throat> then you can take your existing LLC, have it taxed as an, as an S corporation. And as an S corporation, it files a separate tax form, which is an 1120S. So instead of a 1065, it's now an 1120S. On the 1120S, you do the same thing. You fill out the, the income, you fill out the expenses, the same $60,000 net income that I've been talking about in my example, you're paying tax on. The difference now in an S corporation is as the owner, and again, it can be with one owner, as the owner, you are required to pay yourself a salary. Okay, so your company now gives you a W-2. And by doing that, <clears throat> you're paying social security on that W-2 and not, <laughs> not on the rest of the income, not on the rest of the income. Okay, so let's use an example. We, we said the gross is 100, the net is 60. Now I have to pay myself a salary. Well, how much is the salary? Well, why don't I just pay myself zero and then I don't have any social security tax and I save the full 15%, right? Well, it doesn't work like that because the IRS says you have to pay yourself a reasonable compensation. So what's a reasonable compensation? That's a good question and that's not easily determinable. You kind of just make that up, but the tax courts in where, where it's been challenged, they've come out that they like 50%, okay, 50? so 50. So it's kind of established that the government likes 50%. The taxpayers and the tax preparers, we like, we like it to be lower. So there are different factors involved, but let's just say we're gonna use more of a number of like 30, 
percent, give or take. Okay, so just for illustration purposes, let's say your net is sixty, and I pay you a salary of twenty. Okay, on your business tax return, that is a deduction. So we have sixty thousand. We're going to reduce that sixty thousand for your salary, which is twenty, which means your net income is forty. Okay, now on your personal side, you have two things. You have a W-2 now for $20,000 and you have business income of $40,000. You're still paying income tax on 60. But like I keep saying the whole time, you're not getting out of paying income tax on the entire amount. But what did we accomplish by changing the structure? We now are only paying the 15% social security tax on $20,000 instead of on $60,000. So we saved 15% I always say it sounds like a Geico commercial, but we saved 15% on $40,000, which is $6,000, okay? And the higher the numbers, the more you'll save, okay? So usually the example I give is if your net is 100 and you pay yourself 40, so you're paying 15% on the 40, but you saved it on the other 60, so you save $9,000. And again, the more you make, the more you'll save, once you hit that FICA cap, the savings start to get more limited because remember, it's not a full 15% anymore. Okay, hold on one second. So just to finish the example and the thought, what's the downside of doing this? The downside is A, you have less social security being paid in for yourself. So I do have some older folks who say, I need that social security to get paid in because I'm getting closer to that age and I wanna make sure it's maxed out. Now, if you were making high salaries when you were younger, then you don't have that problem because the IRS takes your top 40 quarters, basically your top 10 years of pay throughout your lifetime is what they use. So if you were making a lot as a W-2 earlier, then it's a no-brainer now to just pay yourself less. So it depends where you are uh, in, that, you know, in that situation. But that's one downside of doing this is that you're paying less in for yourself on the social security side. Most people, especially those starting out, don't care. They just want to pay as little as possible upfront. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that you have more filings involved. There, there's now a business tax return. There's payroll involved. There's your personal tax return on top of all of that. Typically, clients of ours where we have all of this and we're doing that right now before January 15th. We're, we're, we're crunching all their numbers from, from the tax planning standpoint. And we want to make sure that they know what the salary should be, what, the, what their withholdings should be, make sure they're covered, and, and, and we have all the numbers straight. So there's time spent on tax planning. But that's in a perfect situation when you're self-employed, the way to do it. Because you're saving way more in taxes than the cost of doing the work and getting it straight. Now, just to show you on the investor side, if you're an investor and you're buying property, depending on the nature and character of that income, all of these same principles apply, okay? And very simply, because it's not the discussion for today, but if you're in a rental situation, there's no social security tax on rental properties. So you don't have to worry about any of this, okay? So you don't need S corporations. You just keep it either in your own name or an LLC. If you are generating ordinary income, which usually means you're, you're, you're renovating or you're in construction, okay? So if, if you're flipping houses for a living or you're in construction for a living, you're doing work for somebody else, or obviously what we're talking about, if you're an agent and you're generating commissions, but I have clients who wholesale deals, they're getting wholesale income, um, all kinds of other ways that they're generating income. If that's your business and that's your self-employment and you're, and, and you're paying this extra tax, then all of these principles apply where you'll save more in the entity side of things than doing it personally through your own name and social security number. You have a question? Yes, I've got a question. So you're paying the social security tax at one time on the reasonable salary or anything like both? You're paying social security on the salary piece, just not one time. one time, not the rest. Okay, so for the example, you're just paying on the 20,000, not the 40,000. Correct. Okay, all right. Thank you. I forgot. <laughs>
Sorry. <laughs> you just start it. You have you have expenses, but not income. You have expenses, but not income. Okay, that, that, that's a good question. That happens. That happens. Um, if you have a business already set up, then you still have to file the business return and pick up the expenses, and you get credit for that. Uh, so your K-1 would be a loss, it would be negative. It would help offset other income that you might have. But if you um, are doing that personally and you're in Schedule C, you can also just put your expenses down and show a loss and potentially offset other income. Again, if your losses are great and it's year after year, you might draw some attention from the IRS how come you keep filing the Schedule C showing us losses every year? Is this really even a business? So there is a three out of five year rule where you're supposed to you know, try to make a profit, but it's in, it's all about your intent. I mean, if you can prove you have a business, because where logs come in and things like that, then yeah, you can definitely write off your business expenses. I, mean, I had a CPA once who told me, if you're not making any money continuously every year, it's a hobby, it's not a business. <laughs> Yeah, that was hard to hear. Right. So if you're not, if you don't have a business to her point. If you're not set up with your own LLC, S corp, whatever it may be, she's just an independent realtor. She hasn't made a dollar all year, but she has <laughs> all her fees, dues, gas, everything. Mm -hmm. That's still a Schedule C. If you're Entry. not set up as an entity, it's a Schedule C, sure. Gotcha. And you didn't put your expenses down. If you are an entity, same. You're just doing it on a different tax return. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, also, I have two other. Questions about the LLC one. Um, do you need, uh, if you were going to be an investor and you had rental property, do you need an LLC for each property? Or is there a minimum number of properties you should have in that one LLC? And then the second one is if you're doing consulting for like educated purposes, I teach a real estate class or whatever they be, is there any protection in having an LLC in that regard? If you're doing a, a, a talk, let's say I was, I'm not, but let's say I was getting paid to do this talk, I, I don't need protection really. So it's not like I need to set up an LLC to do that unless I'm doing other things too, or I'm afraid of getting sued. Gotcha. Um, as far as investors putting, you know, properties into an LLC, um, some people are super nervous and every property they put into a separate company. Some people will put four or five in one and then move on. What I would say is, A, talk to your attorney for the legal side of it, and B, uh, you know, again, if somebody if somebody sues you and you have an LLC and you have two properties in there, one is fully leveraged by the bank and one is owned full, uh, outright, you paid cash for it, right? They're, they're going to sue you. They can't touch the one that the bank owns. They're going to go after the one that you own full of cash. So you want to be careful what, what you combine with each other in the same company. And also a final thought on that is that lenders typically don't like more than five. Some some will go up to 10 properties. So they're gonna they're gonna if it's if there's mortgages they're gonna have limits on that also. Okay so let's move on. We 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 I always spend a lot of time on the entities because I think that that's the most important thing. That's really where the where the savings are. Um, but as far as um, you know, accounting and bookkeeping, um, we talked a little bit about receipts and about what the IRS looks for, et cetera. Um, I, I, I usually have that um, nice red Keller Williams Gary Keller book that uh, that they have probably here on one of the windows. Uh, I have one of those in my office. And if you look in the back there, he has chart of accounts. And things like that for real for for real estate agents, uh, and that's a really good place to start and to look at to to see how to set things up if you want to start to keep some good records for yourself. Now, do you have to go into that much detail? Probably not, but I think everybody is you know different and will want to you know handle that according to based on uh, what they need. Okay, so that's a little bit about that, and then you have what I'll call mixed use accounts, uh, and and this is again you know jumping a little bit towards the end of the outline we talk, I talked about you know your car your business use of home those are the number one questions that I get when it comes to deductions but take any expense that's part personal and part business it could be your car it could be your house it could be your telephone your cell phone it could be anything right 
you're, 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 you know, so it could be X percent is business and X percent is personal. You can, you can take the percentage of business against your business income and, uh, and then the rest is personal. Now, how do you do that if you're really keeping good bookkeeping? So if you're using a software like QuickBooks, that's a good question. And there's the different ways to handle that. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that now, but just keep that in mind. So if you're paying your cell phone bill every month and it runs through your, your software, your QuickBooks as your bookkeeping tool, um, and you come to the end of the year and you say, okay, I spent uh, you know $1,200, $100 a month on my cell phone, and 80% of that is business, the other 20 is personal. You can separate that and put the other 20% to your, what we'll call owner draw distribution. So that brings me to how do you pay yourself, right? Let's say you, 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 you're an S corporation and you're taking a salary. Let's say you're not, and you're just getting a check from them every month or whatnot. You, the money is yours. Either way, an LLC, an S corporation, they're called pass-through entities because everything passes through to the owner and the individual. So you're not going to be looked at, um, you know, where, where, where you have to make a paycheck every two weeks and then you're not allowed to touch the rest of the money. That's not how it works. You can, you can pocket that money, write yourself a check anytime you want. If you decide this month, I want to you know, write myself a check for a few thousand dollars. Really, all that is, is an owner draw. So it's a distribution and it reduces your cash. That's all it is. So that's not a problem. You can do that. You don't have to. When I say you, you need a salary, um, a lot of our one owner S corporations, they take a salary once a year. They don't even take an official paycheck ever. And then on December 31st, we say, OK, we're going to pay you forty thousand dollars. Um, there's no check cut, and we do the payroll tax returns, and they pay the taxes. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, in so what percentage is it? The percentage for taxes? Everybody's different. It depends on your whole tax situation. Remember, this is a pass-through, so then we look to your personal side. You know, um, this past year, the stock market has has been awful. The year before, it was doing really well. We had a lot of clients that made a lot of money in the stock market, capital gain. All of that gets included into what your whole picture looks like. So you have to look at everything. If you have rental properties or you have other sources of income, or if you're married and your spouse has income, all of that will come into play. But that's why when you're self-employed, it's important to set it up right and to do some tax planning before the end of the year to know where you stand and make sure that you're doing everything properly and if there's any ways to save money. So I have a couple of those on here. We're going to try to get um, as far as when I mentioned being a real estate professional, uh, if you are a real estate agent, you're, you qualify as a real estate professional. So if you do have rental property and they are showing losses for taxes, you can offset those losses with other income that you are generating from your from your commissions. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, Sorry, I got one. So if, you, if your property is uh, minus, let's say if you haven't rented it for six months, you have a loss there, you can claim that against your income, like your commission checks. Right. And that's if you're an LLC? No, just an independent. Yeah. Also. Gotcha. Yes, yes. Thank you. but that... There, there is there is an election for that to be claimed as a real estate professional. It's not automatic. So what if, does that mean? Well, that means that you have to do your taxes right. Okay, okay. <laughs> like file the right the right paperwork. You're saying correct. Okay, correct. So if if you are in that boat and 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 you don't know what I'm talking about, then you should look talk to you afterwards. Correct. <laughs> or whoever's doing your tax. Um, okay, so that's real estate professional. Um, I'm going to skip the new stuff. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, let's talk for a second about <clears throat> let's talk for a second about some of the deductions as well as retirement planning. Um, we talked already about your car. Just the main thing there is that you can take your mileage um, and they keep increasing that rate. I think it's now over sixty cents a mile for this coming year. And um, and you can and you can take that or your actual expenses. So if you track your gas and your insurance and all that, your repairs, you can 
pick the higher of the two. You can't flip flop from actual to mileage. You could go from mileage one year to actual, but once you go to actual expenses on that car, you can't switch back. Okay, so keep that in mind as far as your auto expenses go. But usually with the mileage rate uh, and and people that are self-employed, you know, if you're showing houses, you're on the road a lot, traveling, you know, that's usually the way to go. <clears throat> Even if you can take some depreciation on that car um, and bang a lot out in year one, and I'll talk about that in a minute, then what happens in year two and year three and year four and year five, you know? So, so a lot of times, you're still better off, even though in the short term, you might want to depreciate the car, you might be better off in the long term taking the mileage rate. If you're leasing your car, you can take the percentage of business use of the lease payments as well. Um, personal versus business we talked about, that was you know the example I was giving before. And if you're paying your own health insurance, that's also a big deduction over here as far as being self-employed. So keep that in mind too. Um, We talked about paying yourself, you know, whether you're just cutting a check or taking a salary, you, you're not going to 1099 yourself from any, the money that you take out from your company, even if it's you personally, um, it's the same, you, you're just really doing the same thing. So you're not going to 1099 yourself. As far as use of the home goes, <clears throat> obviously over COVID, a lot of people were coming to me and saying, you know, I, 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 I'm working from home and it was just not just self-employed people, it was everybody. Um, you know, the reality is that all the government really gives you for that, no matter what, and you could only work out of your house. The only thing they really give you for that is the percentage based on square feet of the room you're using to the rest of the house against certain expenses. Now, some of those expenses, if you have a mortgage, you're taking anyway your real estate tax, your mortgage interest. So you're not necessarily gaining a whole lot. So if you do itemize your deductions and you already take your real estate tax and your mortgage interest, what are you really taking now? Let's say your room is a couple hundred square feet, your house is a couple thousand square feet or whatnot. Let's just say it's 10, 10, 15% as your business used to, you know, home and you have your utility bill at, you know, 500 bucks a month and some other small stuff, uh, again, leaving out the, uh, the, the real estate taxes and the, and, and the mortgage interest, you know, so maybe you're, you're at about $10,000 worth of expenses that are qualified. Again, maybe some people build an office, that's a different story, and then you're depreciating it. So you're not just taking the whole cost of it anyway. But there are there could be some other things. But I'm talking about the small things. That, you know, your your security alarm, your landscaping, just throwing in whatever you can and drumming up, you know, ten whatever it is, thousand dollars of of expenses for your home. And and, and if your percentage is only you know ten percent, that's a, a whopping one thousand dollar deduction. And that's not dollars. That's a deduction. So if you're at a twenty percent tax bracket, you're saving two hundred bucks. Okay, so I'm um, intentionally kind of dumbing that down for you in a sense of trying to, you know, show you that it's not always all it's cracked up to be. A lot of people call me all bent out of shape about their, the fact that they're working at home now. Okay, you know, calm down, it's not that big of a deal. And we're not talking about tens of thousands of dollars here. Um, again, everybody's different, every case is different, and that's not to say you shouldn't look at it and make sure that you're benefiting from it. Um, <clears throat> there are other deductions related to your home. I'll tell you one if you haven't heard this one, which is going to help you much more than that. Um, <clears throat> if you have a company set up and you have an office that you come to, and yet you have a business and you need to do board meetings for your company, and you choose instead of going and renting a hotel conference room once a month for your company board meetings, you do them in your house, there's a little rule that says if you rent your house out less than a certain number of days, then you don't have to pay tax on that income. So if you pay yourself $400 a month to do the board meetings, now you can write off $4,800 as an expense from your income and get a tax deduction for that $4,800, right? and not pay tax on it, even though you're paying it to yourself, OK? 
Okay, so there are little rules like that that you know some people hear about and call me and say, "Hey, are we doing this?" Um, and then you know sometimes it just depends on the facts and circumstances. If you only work from home, it's not necessarily going to fly to say that I'm doing board meetings in my home and that's my main office. But if you have a place that you could generally come to or a desk that you're paying for, then that is definitely something that could work. So um, when you say, are you just using having a board as a general term? Yeah. Okay, so you can like invite a client to your house to have the consultation, let's just say, in your office at the house. But that's no different than your business use at home. Okay, you don't so get anything more. Meetings? I mean, yeah. how would it apply to us? I guess assigning would that be considered? No, no, no. It, I'm talking about just doing a meeting, an a, a internal meeting for your own company. So you have, you start yourself an S corporation yeah. for these other reasons, okay? And you're saving on the salary and taxes. And then your corporation, okay, needs to do a monthly meeting, for example, for, for the business. So you would have to be a corporation or an LLC to be able to do that. Generally, that's, you know, the rule of thumb. But again, it depends who you ask. And you could be able to forfeit. I, I, I don't want to give a number again, yeah, that okay. depends, you know. Uh, okay. and there's no rule of thumb there that says this is what it is. But you know, if you if you can go online and read about this, I mean, there, okay. there are people out there, you know, talk, they talk a lot Thank about you. this. I get this question all the time. Okay, and we take this for a number of our clients, it just depends, you know, who, what, and how. Okay, another question, yeah. So, for us. Where you are paying a corporation every month after paying the interest, the interest money. So instead of using your home, you can use that, right? And claim the quarterly pay in months. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the number one deduction that you can take is retirement. Um, when people say to me, uh, you know, I'm paying so much in tax, what should I do? What can I do? If you have the cash, the best bet is to put it into retirement. If you're an employee and the company has a 401k plan, <laughs> and typically they'll match. So people will start putting every check, a little bit of money into this retirement account because they want to get also the tax deduction, but also the, the, the free match from the company. When you're self-employed, there's no free match. It's just you, but you can put money into a retirement plan and also many times do a match from the company. So if you're interested in a significant tax deduction, that is really something to look into and is the best way. Now, there are different types of retirement plans that you can choose to put money into. The most simple one is an IRA. There are Roths and regulars. The Roths are not deductible, but if you put into a traditional IRA, it is. So that the, the issue there is that you're limited on the, the dollar amount per year. And there are other limitations as well. If you have a spouse and they have a plan, then you might be limited how much you could put away into an IRA. If you're self-employed though, you can do a SEP. A SEP, self-employed <laughs> pension, you can put away 20% of your earnings. Now, earned income is what you pay social security on, which is why planning is important. If I limit your salary to 20%, you can only put away I'm sorry, it's a 20,000. You can only put away 20% of that 20,000. It's not a lot, it's only $4,000, okay? But the more money you're making, the more you can put away potentially, uh, but your, your salary or your earned income piece uh, is really what it comes down to. So <laughs> that's something really to look at. The 401k, a solo 401k is the best way to put away a lot quicker because there's an employee deferral, which is now around $20,500 a year just for the employee. So put yourself twenty thousand in salary. We could put away twenty thousand as an employee deferral, the whole thing. Okay, and you save taxes on that. Then the match is twenty five percent of your earned income. So if you take a salary of if you take a salary of um, forty thousand dollars on that hundred thousand dollars of income, you could put away around twenty as the employee. And then another 25% of your W-2, which in this case, 25% of 40 is another $10,000. So you could put away $30,000 pretty easily on a very low salary if you have a solo 401k set up. Okay, so that's another thing to keep in mind when it comes to how retirement plans work. Okay, so 
in the last few minutes, when we're going to wrap up, uh, I just wanted to go over a few of these new tax laws, and some of them are are important to know that. Um, a few years ago, they put in this 20%. They put in this 20% deduction for pass-through. It works for Schedule C also. So if your net income is $100,000, you get a $20,000 pass-through tax deduction. And if if you're preparing a return, that's automatic. I mean, if it's a Schedule C, then it should take it. It's called Qualified Business Income Deduction, QBI. Uh, if you're getting a K-1 from a 1065 or, or an 1120S, again, as it goes on to your personal um, return, you should be able to get this 20% deduction as well. There are some limitations, uh, but we, we won't get into the details. There. So that's a 20% deduction. Uh, if you do, if you are already paying salary, uh, if you're, it doesn't count anymore for yourself, but if you're paying salaries, and if you have a company set up to other people, there, there was the employer retention credit, uh, if, if you um, live and breathe in, a, in the United States right now, you have heard commercials and who knows what for this <laughs> and saying, get your tax, you, you know, your COVID money, your refund. Um, this is a payroll tax credit. Uh, when it first came out, it counted even for owner salary. So we were claiming it for one owner, business people who are paying themselves in an S corporation, real estate agents. They did away with the owner's salary. You can't get it on that anymore. But if you are paying it, other people, you can get that still. It's still available. It's, it's, it's an amended payroll tax return. So if three years to do that. Um, and that was for 2020 and most of 2021. Um, the fellow left, but the bonus depreciation, he wanted to be asking before about depreciation. But um, there was there was up until this year bonus depreciation of 100%. So if you buy a laptop for $500, even though you should take depreciation on it, instead of taking it over five years, you can take bonus depreciation, which meant you can take the, the, the whole thing. And that counted for cars too. So if you bought a SUV over 6,000 pounds, you could write the whole thing off if it's all business use up until the end of 2022. And it's been that way for several years. There, the, when the bonus depreciation first came out, it was 30%, it went up to 50, then it went up to 100, and it's been 100. <clears throat> the, the government, when they had made it 100, I believe that was under Trump, they wrote in that it expires at the end of 2022, right? Um, that expired. And right now, because the House flipped and the Senate flipped and everybody's up in limbo. There's nothing really happening. And it's one thing that they want to look at and change, but they haven't yet. So right now that number dropped for 2023 at the moment, 80%. So if you buy an SUV today for business and it's over 6,000 pounds and you thought, oh, I just spent you know 60K on a car, I'm going to take a $60,000 deduction. As of today, that's not the case. You can't. You cannot take that full deduction anymore. So right now, that's at eighty percent, and that goes not just for cars; goes for anything, any any equipment you buy for your business. Um, that so that's the bonus depreciation. There's still something called Section One Seventy Nine expense. So there still might be ways to take everything. The difference between the two is if you if you have a loss, you can't take the one seventy nine. You can only take the bonus. So you would be limited. Um, the last couple things I have here is that uh, the SECURE Act, which is uh, just being passed now, has some really interesting things in there. We're not going to get into that completely. The Maryland Saves Program, if you do have an entity already set up and you're paying $300 a year for it, um, I forgot to mention that, Maryland charges $300 a year to keep the entity going. They, yeah. Yeah, so they they are they are trying to convince everybody now to go to um, to go to setting up retirement plans for their companies, even if it's just you. And they're trying to incentivize everybody to do that. I think they're going to require it at some point. So they they started this program where they'll they'll get you out of paying that three hundred dollars for your business if you qualify if you if you do what you're supposed to do. So. They set up a website for it. Um, it's it's very new. It just came out in the last couple of months. Um, so we're still learning a little bit about that. But if you do have 
Um, if you do have an LLC and there's no payroll, it seems like you can apply. Uh, or if you have payroll, if you have a retirement plan set up, you can also apply. So there's some different factors there, but that's something to keep in mind. So that's what I wanted to mention there. And then finally, the PT deduction. Uh, if you're itemizing and you're capped on your on your state tax deduction, which is now ten thousand, uh, you can pay your state taxes through your company. So if you have a pass through, this, this won't work on a Schedule C. But if you have an LLC that you're preparing a partnership return for or an S corporate return, and you have let's just say again hundred grand of income, if your Maryland is ta Maryland taxes eight percent, they will let you pay eight thousand dollars through the business on your behalf for you personally. So it gets credited over to you personally and you can take a deduction for that 8,000 federally on your business tax return. Okay, as opposed to, even though it's really a personal expense. And the benefit of that is that if you're over that cap personally, if you're filing schedule A, itemized deductions for your taxes and your and mortgage interest of your charity, if you're over the cap of $10,000, uh, you wouldn't have gotten that eight thousand dollar deduction, and now that's a way to get it. Okay, but it has to be paid through the business again on behalf of the owners. Okay, so so it used to work that way only for non-residents. If I had a company and a partner who was a non-resident, Maryland wanted their money, so they would tax the company on his income to make sure they got it, and they wouldn't have to chase him. They're now allowing that for for residents too. And it's a way to get around this cap on uh, it's called the salt state and local tax work around. So again, if, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, uh, and you think it might apply to you, so you know, feel free to ask uh, or whoever's preparing your taxes, just make sure to ask about that. I get asked about that a lot. Is it mandatory to open a Is it mandatory? Mandatory? Mm -hmm. It's not mandatory, but like I said, Maryland is trying to make it mandatory on certain businesses at this point. And solo 401k is different than individual IRAs, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, solo K is different. You, you have to set up a solo K by December 31st. It's too late to do it now for last year. You could still do it for this year, but a SEP you could still do. Yeah, SEP is 20% of earned income. You could still do that all the way till the extended date of your tax return. So if you file a business return and you have an extension, it's due March, you have an extension until September, you have all the way till September to set it up and put the money in. So I have a part-time W2 job and then I'm like, what, I have to buy the business. Say that, I'm sorry, again? So how do I find my if you're doing a business return, it still passes through to the personal. So you get a K-1 from the company and then it goes on your personal return. The, the business isn't going to pay that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I think we're ran over our time. Thanks for bearing with me and listening. I hope it was helpful. Um, you know, again, um, our office 